All right, so I've got the Sony 55mm f1.8 on my Astro modified Sony a7 III, and they are both mounted onto the Star Adventurer 2i. And that's kindly been sent to me by the guys at Skywatcher Australia. So many, many thanks to those guys for sending me this gift. This is not a sponsored video. And if you've followed me for long enough, you know that I've been using the Star Adventurer Pro for a few years now already. But I'm just gonna do some tracking on Orion and create a nice wide field image of the Orion Molecular Cloud Complex. And I'm gonna use that image to show you guys some of the deep space objects that you can find within the constellation Orion. And then I'm gonna pull out my 400 millimeter lens and we're gonna photograph some of those deep space targets and test out the Star Adventure 2. So stick around to see how I go about capturing and editing these images. So this is a single exposure with a 55mm lens at f4, 180 seconds and ISO 640. But after stacking 28 images, a total of 1 hour and 24 minutes, I was able to pull out much more detail and colour resulting in this image here, the Orion Molecular Cloud Complex. It's a huge collection of gas and dust, a star forming region found within the Milky Way between 1,000 and 1,400 light years away from Earth. The most obvious feature is of course the bright Orion Nebula located in Orion's sword. It's visible to the naked eye from dark skies and will even show up in your wide angle images. It's a great target for beginners despite it also being quite tricky due to its high dynamic range, but I'll explain that a bit more later. Now if we zoom in to the star Alnitak, one of the three stars that makes up Orion's belt, we will find the Flame and Horsehead Nebulae. No prizes for guessing where they get their names from. The Horsehead Nebula is a dark nebula that stands out proudly against a backdrop of a H2 region, red in colour due to the prominence of hydrogen alpha emissions, making it a great target for astro-modified cameras. Lastly, if we zoom into the star Rigel, Orion's foot, we will find the Witch Head Nebula. It's a reflection nebula illuminated mainly by the light from the nearby star Rigel and is certainly going to be the most difficult to capture. And it's a target that I haven't photographed before either. So I'm pretty excited and as the skies are clear outside, I'm going to get straight outside and set up. So my biggest issue right now is that I'm based deep in a west facing valley. So there's big mountains blocking my view of the southern horizon and there's big mountains blocking the view of the northern horizon so it's difficult to find a spot where I can see Polaris, the North Star. Whenever I found a spot that I could see Polaris it was often on some sort of wooden platform or balcony so the slightest bit of wind and there was camera shake especially when shooting at 400mm. But eventually I found a spot where I could see Polaris and it had a nice solid stone floor but it was right in the middle of the camp I'm staying in so there's often people around and often music playing so it's very difficult for me to vlog which is why I'm coming at you in the form of voiceover right now. Now the center column on my tripod doesn't rotate so it's important that when I set up my tripod the polar wedge is facing roughly north and then it's very important to level your tripod as well. Then I add the Star Adventurer 2i, also the declination bracket, and the Polar Scope Illuminator, ready for some rough polar alignment. First, I make sure that the altitude of the polar wedge is set to my current latitude, which here in southwest Turkey is 36 degrees north. So I make sure the polar wedge is set to 36 degrees. 
Then, on the side of the Star Adventurer is a little hole known as a polar site, and I make sure that Polaris is within this hole, so that when I do go to do my polar alignment, Polaris is already in view, and that's good enough polar alignment for now. Next, I add the counterweight as well as my camera and lens, and it's time to balance the system. So one of the things I love about the Star Adventure Pro is that you can physically move the entire declination bracket to help balance the system, and then you can make some fine adjustments using the counterweight and just sliding it along the rail. And then once your system is balanced, you should be able to just reposition your camera and it shouldn't rotate and it stays in position. Now I roughly frame my target and at this point you should really check the balance because repositioning your camera can sometimes affect the balance. But in my case I was fine and now it's time to make fine tune adjustments to my composition. So another thing that I love about the Star Adventurer Pro is that you can very easily fine tune your composition so you can turn the knob on the declination bracket to make fine adjustments to the declination and then you can use the arrow buttons on the side of the Star Adventurer to make small adjustments in the right ascension. And if your lens is on a collar, you have another axis of rotation for composition as you can rotate your camera and orientate your target. Now it's time to focus, so I zoom in on a bright star and manually focus and now I'm nearly ready to shoot, I just need to fine tune my polar alignment. So I check the exact position that Polaris needs to be in the reticle using the Star Adventurer Mini Console app and then I adjust the altitude and azimuth accordingly. So this is my setup for the deep space targets. I've got my Sony 100-400mm on my Astro modified A7 III and that's all on top of the Star Adventurer 2. And in the past I've always used Kuwu lens warmers but recently I've been trying out the Kiwi lens warmer but I've had a lot of issues with it turning off after like half an hour of usage and it turns out when it gets hot enough it doesn't draw much power from the power bank and so the power bank automatically turns off. After a little searching on the internet I found out that if you double press the button on the center of the anchor power core one of the blue lights turns green which puts it into trickle charging mode so even when the voltage drops low it should still continue to provide power to the lens warmer and it shouldn't automatically turn off so hopefully that helps some of you out there as well not make the same mistake. Okay, so I'm going to pause the video here because it turned out that this wasn't the whole problem. It turns out the Kiwi lens warmer that I was using has a built-in timer of one hour, which you cannot turn off. So after one hour of use, it just automatically turns off and there's no way of stopping this. But according to the Amazon reviews, it's been updated and it now comes without the time limit. So in that case, I'd highly recommend this lens warmer, but make sure you don't get one that has a one hour time limit because it's really annoying. Anyway, back to the video. Now, normally I'd use an intervalometer to control my camera shutter, my favorite being the Pixel TW283. But the Star Adventurer 2i has built-in Wi-Fi, so you can connect it to your camera using the cable and then use the Star Adventurer mini console app on your phone to dial in your settings. So there's a number of different modes that I'll look into in a future video, but for now I'm just using the normal astrophotography mode. This allows me to choose my shutter speed and also choose the interval between each exposure the number of exposures you want to take and then you choose the tracking rate so obviously see the reel for the stars solar for the sun lunar for the moon half speed if you want to include a landscape as well but still get a few extra seconds without star trailing and there's also a double speed mode which i'm not quite sure what it would be used for at the moment and then there's a custom option as well which i'm gonna look into there's an option for dithering, which again, I'll look into a future video, I'm not sure how necessary it is. And then an option to turn off Wi-Fi, which will save you battery whilst it's tracking, but then you can't reconnect to the device to see how many shots you've taken and how much time is left. And then you can save all of those settings as profiles, which will make setting up quicker next time. 
I'll share my positive and negative thoughts about this app in a future review because I don't want to jump to conclusions straight away. But I'm all set up, I'm polar aligned, I can just about see Polaris from this position, this hard ground. And with the original Star Adventurer, I normally use about 1 minute 30 second exposures and get about a 50% success rate, so I'm going to stick to that for now. So I'm shooting at 1 minute 30, f5.6, ISO 640, we're going to see how that goes. Okay, so although I just mentioned I was going to shoot at 1 minute and 30 seconds, I actually changed my mind last minute and reduced it to just 1 minute. And that was in order to prevent the detail in the highlights of the core from blowing out. This is what makes the Orion Nebula a little bit tricky. It has a very bright core, but then there are also amazing faint details in the darker regions too. So it's a high dynamic range target. So for the Orion Nebula, I ended up shooting at 60 seconds, f5.6, which is the largest aperture you can use at 400mm with the Sony lens, and then ISO 640, which is the lower limit of ISO invariance on the Sony a7 III. And this is what a single exposure looks like. I captured 67 exposures in total, so 67 minutes, and out of those, 37 had nice round stars, which I marked in green, 26 were unusable, mainly from periodic error, those I marked in red, and then there were 4 which had a little bit of trailing, but were still usable for the stacking process. And I marked those in yellow. So adding the green and yellow, that gave a success rate of 61%, totaling 41 minutes of usable exposures. After stacking and editing, this was my final image. Now you can see a lot more of the fainter details and I must admit I'm not quite happy with the core but I think it's a great result considering I only used exposures of the same settings not a HDR technique. Now I really wanted to show the editing process in this video as well but I'm really busy at the moment and I really wanted to get this video out in January. So I'll save the editing for a separate video hopefully next month so make sure to hit subscribe and if you haven't already hit the bell icon to make sure you get notified of my new videos. Next up was the Flame and Horsehead Nebulae and this time I did use 1 minute and 30 seconds as it's a much fainter target and there's no bright core to worry about blowing out. So this is what a single exposure looks like and this time I took 49 exposures totaling 73 minutes 30 seconds. Out of the 49, there were 25 green, 4 yellow, and 19 red, giving a success rate of about 59%. Surprisingly similar to the 1 minute exposures of the Orion Nebula, and very similar to what I used to get with the Star Adventurer 1. But after stacking and editing, this is what my final image looked like. Also, I mentioned at the start of the video that my camera is Astro Modified and I've made an entire video about this which I'll link above and down below but essentially I've had filters in front of the sensor removed so that it is four times more sensitive to hydrogen alpha emission light which you can see as the deep red colour in this image. You can still take this kind of photo with a non-modified camera but it will take much longer to get a similar result, at least four times longer. I'm kind of happy with the result, I could certainly do with a lot more data to unveil the fainter details and there's still a fair bit of visible noise in there so I'll probably take more exposures and add that data to this data and hopefully improve the result. As for the Witch Head Nebula, I use the same exposure settings as the Flame and Horse Head Nebula, which is pretty much my limit for this setup. 1 minute 30 second exposures, f5.6, the widest aperture I can use at 400mm. This time round, I took 136 exposures, totaling 204 minutes or 3 hours and 24 minutes. 16 were ruined by cloud, so I marked those in purple. Then there were 53 that were green, 26 yellow, a big increase on the previous two, so not sure if my polar alignment was a little bit off, and then 41 red. 
So including the yellows, there was a success rate of 53%, again, similar to the previous result, and very similar to what I got with the original Star Adventurer. And this is what a single exposure looks like. And you can barely see the Witch Head Nebula at all, but after stacking and editing, I was able to unveil the conspicuous Witch Head shape. I'm pretty happy with the results considering the setup and how faint this target is. It's just a large collection of gas and dust reflecting the light of nearby stars. Unlike the previous targets which were emitting their own light or blocking the light in the case of the Dark Horse Head Nebula. But I could definitely do with more exposures here as I had to do a lot of stretching the data to unveil the faint details which simultaneously unveils a fair amount of noise as well. But overall I'm happy with this result, especially as it's the first time I've photographed it and it's always nice to add a new target, a new subject to your collection. But that is all for now guys, I'll share my thoughts and review about the Star Adventurer 2 soon and I'll also try and get the editing video out next month as well. So thanks for watching another Astro Vlog and if you're going out to enjoy the night sky anytime soon, I wish you good luck and clear skies.